Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. And I'm sometimes amazed at the things people say about the Bible, and I find that most people who say, well, the Bible's all mixed up or full of errors or just written by men, they've never even read the Bible. And what I like to do is just take my Bible and say, well, here, show me one of the errors, you know? Be happy to discuss that with you, to work it out with you. And once in a while, somebody will have a legitimate thing. Show, well, here's something I'm confused by, and then we get a real discussion. We are in the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 14, finishing up with Pastor Sam's message, The Voice of the Martyrs. Now we've been discussing the death of John the Baptist, and through this, Sam helps us get a better understanding of the motives of people like Herod, but also the heart of God. Let's listen in. He had had, John of course, we'll read it in a moment, put to death, because John had rebuked he and Herodias for living in open and wanton immorality. It was actually worse than that. You might think, well, what's worse than immorality? Well, immorality, living with your brother's wife. And uh, that's what he was doing. And she, by the way, was, was a niece of these guys, granddaughter of Herod the Great, first married to Philip Herod, and then, well, not really a divorce. She just sort of eloped and went away one day and, and ended up with this Herod. And, and so now she's living with a second Uncle Herod and, and uh, in open idolatry and immorality with him. And so John seeing this, being the kind of guy he was, he says, hey, this, this is just wrong. I, I don't know if anyone else in the kingdom at that time would have stood up in the face of Herod and said, what you're doing is immoral. What you're doing is illegal. And by the way, Herod, being a descendant of Esau, well, he knew the law. He, he had an understanding of, of what was going on in the, the law of Moses. And so it was not only immoral, though it was greatly that, it was illegal to marry someone within your own family, to marry someone who was already married, to marry your brother's wife. Well, it, it was about as bad as it could get. I mentioned that he had a guilty conscience, but he also had a superstitious nature. He's thinking, this must be John, risen from the dead. Now, if he'd done any research, he would have known that John and Jesus were contemporaries, that John and Jesus were cousins. And I'm sometimes amazed at the things people say about the Bible who've never read the Bible, or the things they say about Jesus. And, and I'm like, well, where did you hear that? And they say, well, some book says, you know, married to Mary Magdalene, had a bunch of kids and stuff. I said, I don't think so. Well, I read it in a book. I go, well, I read in this book that it never happened, you see. And I find that most people say, well, the Bible's all mixed up or full of errors or just written by men. They've never even read the Bible. And what I like to do is just take my Bible and say, well, here, show me one of the errors, you know. Be happy to discuss that with you, to work it out with you. And once in a while, somebody will have a legitimate thing. Show, well, here's something I'm confused by. And then we get a real discussion. But mostly it's just a smoke screen. People saying, well, I don't believe it. I won't buy into it. Well, I, that's not, well, they got to deal and wrestle with those issues. Well, we're told here then that this guy was superstitious and that he believed John might actually have somehow come back to life in the person of Jesus. Now, another irony here is that John, though he was a wonderful and mighty and faithful prophet, he was not a miracle worker. He did no miracles. In fact, you can study through, you'll find not only does the uh, scripture make that clear, but Jesus, on the other hand, he did many mighty miracles. And John points to Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God. He simply could have interviewed John and figured out that this wasn't the case. Well, Herod, we're told in verse 3 then, had laid hold of John, bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Already made mention of the the sort of bizarre uh, relationship triangle going on there. Herod takes his brother's wife, who sh never should have married Philip in the first place, but now she's with Herod. And John gets in his face and says, it's not lawful for you to have her. Now, I don't know if it's possible for us to get a sense of how bold that was of John. Because probably the closest we could get to it would be like going to our boss or something and saying, Hey, what you're doing is illegal. What you're doing is immoral. What you're doing is wrong. You need to confess. You need to repent. Chances are, well, if your boss is a Christian and you say that, there's a pretty good chance that he will confess, he will repent, and you'll get a promotion. But 
there's also a pretty good chance that you'll be looking in the yellow, or not the yellow pages, the, uh, the classifieds tomorrow. Why? Because if your boss doesn't confess and repent, he's not going to take that rebuke lightly. He's going to say, uh, hey, hit the road. But this is a little different, you see. John wasn't working for Herod. He wasn't in the position of maybe risking his livelihood. No, he was risking his very life to stand in the face of Herod and say, what you're doing is wrong. And I'd suggest to you that in these last days, God is raising us up, his people, to be real witnesses unto him. And if we're afraid to witness at school or at work, if we're afraid to be made fun of or mocked or rejected or fired, how will we ever stand up to the real opportunities that will later present themselves? Listen, if you're faithful now, God will continue to give you opportunities to share him. And he can completely blow your mind at the, the doors he opens and the, the uh, opportunities that he presents. But John comes before this mighty ruler. John, who was just hanging out in the wilderness, minding in his own business, telling everyone to repent. But they were coming to him, remember? Somehow he finds himself before Herod. And he tells Herod, it's not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. You see, Herod didn't really like what John was saying, but because he was weak and vacillating and and driven not by principle or purpose, but by fear and greed and lust, he's like, well, he's the ultimate politician. Let's do a poll. Oh, the people like him. Well, we better not put him to death. Maybe we can just imprison him and see how things go. And that's really what happened at this point. He puts him in prison, wanting to put him to death, but unable to because of his fear of the masses, of the multitudes. Well, an opportunity does then present itself. Herod's birthday was being celebrated, and we're told the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased them. Herodias, one of the most wicked since Jezebel of the Old Testament, not only was she idolatrous and immoral, not only was she ambitious beyond reason, well, she was willing to put her daughter in a position where she would be defiling herself and disgracing herself by dancing before that drunken, well, I I don't know any other way to describe the crowd, just out of it crowd celebrating Herod's birthday. Now you need to know, and though we don't need to draw any mental pictures, it's highly unlikely that she was clogging or doing the river dance or something, you see. <laughs> the dances that they were into were lewd and immoral. And what impressed him was, well, her perversity. And I'm thinking, here's a young gal whose mother is supposed to be raising her to be, well, modest and, and proper. And listen, moms, take take heed. If your little gal wants to dress like Britney Spears, it's your responsibility to say, no way. Not, oh, you're so cute in that, honey. Because I guarantee you, the guys checking out your little gal aren't thinking, she's so cute in that, honey. They are thinking completely different things. And if you're not sure, ask your husband. He'll confirm all this. <laughs> and if mom isn't going to get with it. I only say mom because I think moms need to build bridges to their daughters. You don't want to alienate dad from your daughter. There's already sort of a natural tension built in there. But I think husbands and wives need to get together on this kind of stuff. Am am I picking on Brittany? Am I down on cute little girls dressing? No, listen, that's not it at all. But there is a modesty and a propriety that no longer exists in this society. And it needs to at least exist in our church, not just when we gather together, not just for our fellowships and our baptisms and our, our get-togethers, but, but when your, your little gal goes off to school or your guy goes off to school, we're charged with the responsibility of training them and modeling to them what it means to be godly and modest. And there is a great need today for such teaching from parents. Well, Herodias was anything but godly and modest. And, and she passed on what she was, tragically, to her daughter. Not just corrupting her and sending her out to dance, but, but actually putting her up to asking, as we'll see in a moment, for the head of John the Baptist. Well, I'm getting ahead of the story, though. Herod's birthday, daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Now, the Old Testament said, don't make these kinds of oaths. And if you're foolish enough to make one and you realize you have, go back and say, hey, I made a wrong and foolish oath. I need to get out of it. I ask your forgiveness. But we're going to see that Herod is the kind of guy 
that, well, he won't do the right thing, but when it comes to something like, well, I got to keep my word regarding an evil thing, well, somehow his warped sense of values and, and importance would allow him to say, well, I've got to be a man of my word. Well, he should have been a man of the word, and then he could have been a man of his word, because he never would have made such an oath. Jesus, of course, tells us, let your yes be yes. And your no be no. You don't need to swear to anything if you're an honest person. And I tend to not trust people that got to swear on a stack of Bibles or on their mother's grave. Or why do you got to swear at all? Just say yes and do it. Or say no and don't do it. And that's Jesus' counsel to us. That's his wisdom for us. Well, he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, Mark chapter 6 kind of fleshes this out for us. She goes back to her mother. She's not right there at the moment. And she says, hey, what, what should I ask for? Herodias finally gets her chance. And as much as Herod disliked John or struggled with the rebuke, Herodias was absolutely filled with hatred for him. And prompted by her mother, she says, verse 8, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Now the king, we're told, was sorry. Sorry? He's sorry? Yeah, I'm really sorry, but yeah, go chop off his head and bring it here. Nevertheless, we read, because of the oaths, because of those who sat with him at the table, he commanded it to be given to her. He was sorry, but he still had John beheaded in the prison. He still had his head brought out on a platter before all those guests, given to this young gal who then took it as a trophy back to Herodias. Well, he sent and had John beheaded in prison, his head brought on a platter, given to the girl. She brought it to her mother, as I just shared. And his disciples came and took away the body and buried it, went and told Jesus. Now, there's something here that is oh so important. I already mentioned that John's last recorded words, John the Baptist, that is, were words of confusion and doubt. But you got to know that Jesus settled his heart by saying, go back and tell John the things you see. Jesus was fulfilling every prophecy John needed to know. Yeah, I had it right. I heard from the Father right. I identified him right. I know who he is. I know what he's here to do. But John's doubts, well, they still left him in the prison. He didn't get out because he figured out who Jesus was. And ultimately, it leads to this tragic, well, from this perspective, it appears a tragic death. What about from heaven's perspective? Well, absent from the body, ultimately, at this point, our point, present with the Lord. That means when people die, even though we may not understand the circumstances surrounding their deaths, and we can't really understand, God, how could you let that happen to someone who loves you and served you and was a witness for you? How could that happen? All we need to know is absent from the body, present with the Lord, and that not a sparrow falls to the ground, that the Lord doesn't take notice. He's well aware, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And there are lots of things that I see an experience that I just can't make sense of. And when I'm faced with things, confronted with things I can't understand, here's what I do. I fall back on those things I do understand. I know that God is for me and not against me. That means if circumstances say otherwise, well, God's word is always true. And he says he's for me and not against me. So the circumstances lie. If my feelings are saying, well, he doesn't, I don't feel like he's for me. His word says he is. And my feelings can lie. But God can never lie. He's always right. He's always righteous. He's always just. And it's interesting to note how often things turn out in a way you wouldn't expect. At one point in the book of Acts, both Peter and James are arrested. James is ultimately beheaded. Peter's released from prison, only to die later. But, but in that case, it's like, well, I'm sure some were wondering, well, why didn't God get James out? I mean, he got Peter out. Couldn't he have gotten James out? Of course, he sent an angel to deliver Peter. And he could have delivered James, but he chose instead to let James lay down his life as a martyr for him. In fact, the first martyr recorded in the book of Acts follows on the heels of a guy we're very familiar with, and that was Peter. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, preaches, and 3,000 people get saved. First martyr following after Peter's preaching is this guy named Stephen. And it's interesting to note that he preaches well, very much the same message that Peter did to a very similar crowd with a sort of similar response. You see, back in Acts 2, it says they were cut to the heart, and then they cried out, what must we do to be saved? In Stephen's case, they were cut to the heart, and they cried out, gnashing at him with their teeth, and they stoned him with stones, putting him to death. Now, here's my suggestion to you. 
When Peter stands before the Lord, he's going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. What do you think is going to happen for Stephen? Man, you really blew it down there, you know. None of those people got saved. No, it's going to be well done, good and faithful servant, you see. Why? Because both of them delivered the message and both of them put their lives on the line to do it. The only difference was the response of the people. And sometimes we get confused about this. We think that we're not being good witnesses because the people we're witnessing to aren't responding in the way we hope they will. But at least, listen, at least they didn't kill you. You're still here, see? It's not as bad as it could be and has been for others. And so ultimately, when we stand before God, the test won't be, how did they respond to you? But were you faithful to deliver the message? Were you a faithful witness? Something radical and wonderful happens, by the way, at Stephen's martyrdom. I bring him up because, like, like John the Baptist, he was martyred for being a faithful witness. And Stephen, and if you're familiar, Ephesians tells us Jesus, of course, seated at the right hand of the Father. But when Stephen is being stoned, he gazes up into the heavens and the Lord does something radical. He opens it up. So Stephen can see the throne of God. It's very rare in Scripture. John gets a vision of the throne in in, uh, the book of Revelation. You find Ezekiel catching a glimpse back in his book. But but it's not a very common experience, even for the people of God, the the big guys in the Bible. But what happens is Stephen says, "I I see the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. He saw Jesus, not seated as Ephesians says he is, but standing, I would suggest, He was standing to receive Stephen as he was being stoned, martyred for his faith in Christ Jesus. An ultimate witness. He testified with his words, with his life, and then he laid down his life because that's what the Lord required of him. The ultimate testimony, the ultimate martyrdom, giving your life for your faith in Christ Jesus. Stephen also prayed, as did our Lord from the cross, Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Stephen prays, Lord, don't lay this sin to their charge. Don't put it on their account. It's a powerful prayer. It's a powerful thing to consider that someone being murdered by an angry mob would pray, Lord, don't charge this sin to their account. Well, What about those who claim to be martyrs, who who consider themselves martyrs, whose people believe they're martyrs today? I'm talking about those who blasted into the World Trade Center and it was our two year anniversary of anniversary, excuse me, of that that great tragedy just on Friday or Thursday and and. What about them? You know, they consider themselves martyrs, their families, their, their people, their culture. They consider them martyrs, were they? Well, not in a biblical sense of the word, and here's why. Someone who murders innocent people as they're laying down their life in a suicide, really, that's not the kind of martyrdom that the Lord is going to reward. In fact, someone who murders others, the Bible says a murderer doesn't have eternal life. No murderer has eternal life. So those who flew those planes into the World Trade Center, those suicide bombers in the Middle East today who laid down their lives, listen, they've embraced a lie. They think that they're going to wake up on the other side of this and and it's going to be glorious. They're going to wake up in a Christless eternity in hell. And that's why, by the way, though we may have very strong feelings about all those events, the Lord says as individuals, not as a society, but as individuals, We need to be forgiving. If you're hating people because of what they've done, you need to forgive them. That's what Jesus calls us to do as individuals. Now, as far as society, he who takes a man's life, his life should be and will be taken. That's the law. And we're looking at those things on Wednesday night, by the way. If you're interested, come and we'll be looking at depth and in some detail as to the difference of Jesus teaching concerning, say, the death penalty and and, uh, what goes on culturally uh, and with the the leaders of the society. So in any case, that martyrdom that those people experienced that has nothing to do with being a biblical martyr or an acceptable martyr, those who die in the process of murdering others, well, they're murderers, not martyrs. But these, John the Baptist, Stephen, and so many others, they die in the process of trying to save others. You see, when John rebuked Herod, His hope wasn't just that, hey, I'd love to just get in Herod's face and tell him what a sinner he is. No, his hope was that Herod would confess and repent. 
that he would be cleansed and restored. That was the purpose of John's ministry. His ministry was characterized by one word, repent. And he used it faithfully and readily. But you need to know, and I mentioned it in the introduction, that Jesus' disciples, well, 10 of the 12 laid down their lives, died as real martyrs, trying to save others' lives. Not trying to take people out with them or take people out at all, but trying to pull people in to them and introduce them to the Lord Jesus. Simon Peter, and we get all this from tradition with the exception of just one of these guys, and that's James the elder. We know from Acts 12, 1 and 2, that he's beheaded by Herod. But Simon Peter was crucified, and tradition tells us he was crucified upside down because that was his request. He didn't feel worthy to be martyred as was his Lord, and so he asked to be crucified upside down. John, I mentioned earlier, banished to Patmos, the only one to die a natural life. Andrew, Peter's brother, crucified. Philip, martyred, crucified. Bartholomew, we know him as Nathaniel. Some say he was flayed to death, others crucified, possibly both. Thomas died by spear thrust. Matthew martyred in Ethiopia by the sword. James the Less crucified in Egypt. Jude, Thaddeus killed by arrows. Simon the Zealot crucified. But the real issue in those men's lives, those martyrs' lives, isn't how they died, but why they died. You see, God does allow his faithful witnesses sometime to witness in the fullest sense of the word. And if God's called you to represent him, and you got to know he has, then, then you need to be living for, I need to be living for him and willing to die if he calls me to it for him. The Apostle Paul laid it out this simply, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. I'd suggest that if you were to say, for me to live is, and you have anything else but Jesus Christ in the place of where Paul put Christ, then there's no way you can say to die is gain. If to live is anything, any accomplishment, any goal, any aspiration, anything but Jesus, well, to die is loss because you're going to leave behind whatever it is you're after and doing and pursuing. But if you're living for Jesus, you can be sure when you die, you'll be with Jesus. So to live for him and then to die is gain. I pray that that's reality for every person here. And I think the challenge would simply be, if you're not living for him and you call yourself a Christian, live your life for the Lord Jesus. Don't worry about the repercussions of being a faithful witness. There are worse repercussions for not being a faithful witness. Other lives are at stake. Your life is secure. And so the bottom line is, if you're his, live like you're his. Say with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if you're not a believer at all, listen, to live without Christ means you die and go into a Christless eternity, a place the Bible describes as hell, calls hell and describes in a way that I guarantee you, you don't want to go there and you don't have to go there. And you need to know that hell was never even made for human beings. It was created for the devil and the other fallen angels. But tragically, sadly, Jesus says, unless you believe I am, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe I am. Jesus invoking that name given by God to Moses. And, he, and who is Jesus when he says I am? The way, the truth, and the life. The resurrection and the life. The only door to the sheepfold. Our only hope. If you've never opened your heart to him, I pray you will today. If you've given your life to him, I pray you'll live for him today. Philippians 2.3 teaches us, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And I wonder how often this kind of thing, selfish ambition, gets in the way of us becoming a faithful witness. Now I know as we begin to love others the way God does, and as we begin to put others' needs before our own, and as we become burdened with others' lives the way Jesus is, it's almost impossible not to see the greatest need the world has is Jesus. And faithfully witnessing for Christ to them is simply a fruit of this, and I pray we all can learn to be faithful witnesses regardless of the effort or the cost. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.